Gymnastics has always been a graceful sport, executing difficult skills with perfection. When gymnastics first began in the early 1900s, it was merely a woman's sport. But all this ended in the era of Nadia and Olga. In the 1972 Olympics, teenage Olga Korbut stunned the arena by having two skills named after her. The first ever backward release on uneven bars, back when the bars were closer to one another and the first backward aerial somersault on balance beam. Receiving a gold medal on vault, many coaches took into their account her small frame and pubescent body type. At the following 1976 games, Nadia Kalmanich rose to the scene at only 14 years old. Very short and slender, Nadia was flat with no hips and straight as a board. She hadn't hit puberty, and this meant that her weight was lighter than those gymnasts competing against her. Nadia dazzled the stage and received the first ever 10 at the Olympics on her bars routine. This luck wouldn't end though, and she would follow six more perfect 10s that Olympics. Coaches were stunned. Such a young gymnast had the capability of scoring not one, but seven perfect 10s in one meet, and they needed to find a way to do it too. And the only logical reason was the gymnast itself. If I were to get a young gymnast, could she be the new Nadia? From there on, coaches learned being petite was a major advantage. Smaller bodies rotate more easily, so they can do more tricks that yield more points with a shorter time frame. Russian and Romanian gymnastic coaches were the first to figure this out. In the 1960s and 1970s, their early talent development schemes spat out children who could do everything their adult opponents could do, and more. After the Nadia and Olga era, America began to develop the same formula that Russia and Romania had been doing. In 1976, the average U.S. Olympian was about 5 feet 3 inches and weighed 105 pounds. In 1992, the average had dropped from about 4'9 and 85 pounds. Since this time, the age of the gymnasts has gone down along with their weight. They were the overly skinny kids for a while, Bill Sands noted. There was a brief spurt of strong muscular girls. Mary Lou was an example. And then it went back to skinny. Everyone respected this transition, though. In a 1992 article, Rita Brown stated, We can't have a team full of 19 to 20-year-old women. We are choosing children that are smaller and lighter. Because we are seeking those kinds of body types, gymnasts are going to be at a younger age. And it worked. Gymnastics back then could send kids to the Olympics before they could drive. And they were winning, too. The average age in the 2000s ranged in the mid-teens, and for those who were 18, it was a last shot for the Olympics. Coaches began to change the culture of the sport after the 1970s time period. The close relationships between gymnast and coach is irreplaceable. The gymnast's goal is to please the coach because they are the ones giving advice. If the coach says to point the toe, then they point the toe. If the coach says to tighten up, then they will. And if the coach, who is strict and demanding, asks to cut calories to win, then they will do so. To ensure a competitive edge, they may instruct girls to lose weight, teach them how to diet, Tell them what they can and cannot eat. Routine weigh-ins become the norm. This thought process to please the coach makes the gymnast become a perfectionist. The coach says to lose weight. If you lose weight, you will be perfectly able to compete. But if a girl is highly perfectionistic and achievement-oriented, she is a good candidate for an eating disorder. Most women embrace puberty because it develops breasts, hips, and body confidence. But to a gymnast, it could mean the end of the career. It could mean reducing relief moves because of the height or lowering passes because one doesn't twist as fast with an additional five pounds. These are what the coaches tell them. And what a coach says counts. It becomes a goal to please the coach to be the perfect size, the perfect weight. And that goal can lead to the unhealthy obsession of focusing on the body and less on the sport. The gymnast becomes so fixated because in their mind, the only way she can improve her performance 
is through what she eats and how often she eats it. There are two main types of eating disorders that gymnasts face, which is anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is categorized by severely cutting calories. In this disorder, the gymnast will lose 15% or more of their body weight in a means to lose weight or desired outcome. Normally, this disorder is more noticeable physically since the gymnast begins to lose a substantial amount of weight and shows symptoms of feeling dizzy or weak. Bulimia is a binge purge syndrome in which huge quantities of food, sometimes totaling as much as 20,000 calories in a day, are consumed in short periods of time and then expelled through self-induced vomiting, excessive exercise, the use of diuretics or laxatives, or some combination of those methods. Typically, this disorder isn't as noticeable because the gymnast keeps at the same body weight or loses a small amount of weight that isn't life-threatening. Typically, this high pressure from the culture is engraved in their heads. Lose weight or do everything you can to prevent yourself from gaining weight. Some girls just can't handle the high pressure that this culture entails on their little shoulders. Some girls will turn to binging and purging to cope with the emotional turmoil, and others will just cut back on food entirely to satisfy their inner demons that they face. Both eating disorders begin as a goal to help themselves in the sport, but when they get addicted, they lose touch on why they began doing it in the first place. For instance, while consuming huge quantities of food, the gymnast is not worried about the next competition, how she will perform, or how the officials will rate her efforts. Rather, she is focused only on the food. And when a gymnast gets engraved in losing weight, she no longer focuses on pleasing the coach or the judge. She is only focused on pleasing the piece in her head that says to lose weight. At the turn of the 80s, coaches focused on weight and age was as, or if not, more important than the gymnast status. The trend of the time was the gymnast physique, and all the coaches in America were beginning to follow that trend. As Caroli's departure from Romania to America began, so did the increased fixation on body types. Don Peters, the Strausses, and many others began to believe that a gymnast's performance was determined no longer on just skills, but on what they looked like and the sides of the gymnast. International judges became fixated on body types after seeing Nadia's successful career. Certain sports are strictly performance-based, and if this wasn't clear before, it was now. A gymnast could no longer live off of just her skills to receive a perfect 10, and the trend kept growing and growing until eventually it became the culture. Gymnastics was now a full-fledged judge sport, and it was no longer just about the skills being performed. Research indicates that female athletes in judge sports have a 13% prevalence of eating disorders, compared to just 3% in the general population. Former trainer Jack Rockwell claimed in 1985 that a judge confronted Mary Lou, once saying, You know, if I could, I'd take half a point off just because of that fat hanging off your butt. Because of the culture change, the pressure to be thin was no longer coming out of the coaches' mouths, but also from those who handed out medals. Like some gymnasts, those like Mary Lou, claimed that they could handle this feedback, but to many others, they could not. Decades ago, mental health was not as discussed as it is today. Words like depression, eating disorders, and suicide ideation were hush-hush because, in those terms, it could mean a damper in a gymnast's career. Because it wasn't discussed, there wasn't proper education for it. Coaches didn't know that words could hurt a child, and those who did swept it under the rug. Mental health wasn't just something that was discussed, because children couldn't surely have those emotions at such a young age. In a 1992 article following the Olympics, the public challenged the organization, wondering if children are being abused because of their numerous injuries and rumors of poor eating. The organization was outraged. The U.S. Gymnastics Federation fired back from numerous angry letters, 
None of the gymnasts needed psychiatric or medical counseling after the Olympics, but people believed otherwise after numerous gymnasts had resorted to severe eating disorders. In 2021, the Association for Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders reported that 18% of females in the U.S. suffer from eating disorders. And those who are in pressure sports at the elite level are more likely to develop an eating disorder. Why is this? One of the reasons leads back to the culture. A child is simply a child, too young to make decisions for themselves, so the coach makes decisions for them. Their choreography, skill set, and hours of practice. A child simply cannot think of their physical capability. At home, parents control the child's health and leisure time. They limit the child to public outings unless it's related to gymnastics. They can't make decisions about who to play with, what to watch, or where to go because it's strictly gymnastics. And at school, which rarely is at public school, that time is decided by the teacher on what to learn. And generally, they are isolated by their parents teaching them. Because they are children unable to make decisions for themselves, they long for some sense of control. And at that age, one of the only things children have some amount of independence is through food. And most parents and coaches don't notice it either because they are so focused on the child's career that they miss the warning signs. In a 2010 survey, it showed that only 28% of elite gymnastics mothers reported eating disorders in their children. Parents become so fixated on making their child perfect that they forget that they are simply a child, that they still need help dealing with all the pressure. And the coach encourages the child to lose weight because they assume that they can handle it physically. And the judges deduct points even when the gymnast wobbles from being so weak. For decades, commentators would publicly show the weight of each gymnast on TV during meets, praising gymnasts for losing weight after returning from the off-season. Kim Zemiskel said in 1992, If you're a girl, you're better when you're younger, and you haven't really gone through puberty yet. It's easier to flip over and go higher when you weigh less. Children were so brainwashed into thinking that this was the only way to win. They didn't know that this behavior would lead them down a deep, dark path. In 1968, qualifying at the youngest age on the team, 15-year-old Kathy Rigby would make her first international debut. That same year, she would become world champion. Nobody knew that her success would lead to 12 years of bulimia. She would experience cardiac arrest twice. Cardiac arrest is when the heart stops beating, leading to a lack of blood flow into the body. In cardiac arrest anorexia, the heart gradually becomes smaller and weaker as the eating disorder develops. As the heart becomes fragile, it becomes more difficult to circulate blood at a healthy rate. Eventually, in serious cases, the heart will eventually stop beating. Kathy Rigby, stating once that she learned to be bulimic long before the Corollis arrived on the scene, now realized just how close she was to death, because although she was fortunate, not all were. Kathy Johnson, who entered the scene at a late age, was told by her coach, Vanny Edwards, that if she wanted to make the 1984 Olympics, that she must lose weight. It hurts something deep down inside me. He might as well just said, you're a horrible person. Once, trying to do a double backflip in practice, Johnson attempted this skill with such a weak body that she ended up barely making it around the first rotation and landing on her neck in the middle of the second flip. She was rushed to the hospital and placed in a neck brace. Maddie Larson said she used to consume so many laxatives that she was worried about having an accident in her leotard during practice. And some of these coaches encouraged it. They disregarded a gymnast's health. Consuming too many laxatives can lead to severe dehydration, mineral deficiencies, and electrolyte disturbances. Laxative abuse can lead to long-term abuse, damaging nerves and muscles in the colon. Michelle Hilsey would also be rushed to the hospital because of her eating disorder when she had malfunctioning bowels. Even after leaving the elite scene in the late 1980s, she would continue to struggle 
with her eating disorder during her college career at Utah. It's not fun, she stated in a 1989 article. Her college coach stated, She was miserable every day when she came to practice, and that's not what this sport's about. In 1992, the American College of Sports Medicine first recognized that girls and women in sports are susceptible to three conditions that seem to work together for harm. Disordered eating, menstrual irregularity, and osteoporosis. In the 1992 NCAA survey, 51% of the women's gymnastic programs that responded reported eating disorders among team members, a far greater percentage than in any other sport. In a Sports Illustrated article, one anonymous world-class gymnast admitted that while she was at UCLA, the entire team would binge and vomit together following meets. It was, she said, a social thing. 1996 Olympic alternate Teresa said that she admired a gymnast that ate a low-fat diet. If parents and coaches could realize the lasting damages that words have on a child, then maybe they could stop themselves from doing it. But some coaches still encourage it. Even after decades of people suffering, they rely solely on training a female child's body into a boy. Kelly Hill once said, Gymnasts are easier to train when they are younger because they have a boy body type. But coaches don't process that they are not boys, and without puberty, they can suffer serious complications. One of these is amenorrhea. When the body restricts calories, it restricts energy, disrupting the menstrual cycle. This results in amenorrhea, where many people, like Michelle, for instance, may skip periods even once they have left the puberty stage. Amenorrhea is also celebrated in gymnastics because it means that it's preventing a girl from becoming a woman. But amenorrhea slows down the production of estrogen, which is needed in young gymnasts. Low estrogen delays muscles from recovering, and low estrogen levels don't maintain proper bone structure. This is because the low estrogen increases bone absorption and decreases bone production. Low estrogen can also lead to low calcium levels because it lowers calcium absorption. At a 1996 seminar, a statistic concluded that female gymnasts take in 600 milligrams of calcium per day, less than half the average requirement of a 1,500 milligrams needed for the healthy development of bones. Bones are made of many different minerals, but primarily made of calcium salt. Both spongy and compact bone rely on calcium salt for healthy bones. Compact bones are responsible for storing calcium salt, but when the body does not have enough, it will begin to steal it from compact bone. Over time, this will gradually weaken the spongy and compact bone with its loss of calcium, resulting in premature osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, or porous bone, is when low bone mass is present and increased risk of fracture. Even a simple cough could break a rib depending on the severity. One doctor in a Sports Illustrated article stated, from gymnasts, I've seen x-rays of an anorexic of four or five years and those of a 70-year-old that are very similar. Anorexics have suffered stress fractures just from walking down the street. We have the bodies of old people, said Maddie Larson back in 2018. Many people concluded in the early 1990s that this could be a factor in the reason why so many gymnasts have so many fractures. But this isn't all. The health complications are endless. Anemia, or low hemoglobin in the blood, leads to low oxygen flow in the muscles. Not eating enough leads plummeting blood sugar levels, which damages the liver and can lead to seizures. Every time someone vomits, they throw up stomach acid. Stomach acid rots the teeth of the gymnast and, if they are sticking their fingers down their throats to induce vomiting, their fingernails. Their throats get swollen and lacerated. And the more the gymnast vomit, the more risk they have of gastrointestinal bleeding or risk damage to the vocal cords, or gum disease. And consuming too many laxatives can lead to many problems like bowel nerve damage, cathartic colon syndrome, dehydration, and, in severe cases, kidney failure.
If the kidney isn't functioning, this can lead to death. Gymnasts are at a great risk for eating disorders, but many of these problems aren't discussed and weren't discussed back then. It would take someone to go such a deep, dark road until the organization would be forced to deal with this problem. It had to make such a statement that to them, they would have to address the problem that had been hurting their gymnasts for decades. Or so the public thought. Christy Henrich, two-time national team member, had her eyes set on nothing but making the 1988 Olympic team. A straight-A student, her friends and family nicknamed her E.T. for extra tough. Christy was a perfectionist, always striving to please her family and friends. In 1988, while at a meet in Budapest, Al Fong and Christy were at a luncheon with an international judge, Greta Treiber. Treiber, who would be inducted into the Gymnastics Hall of Fame that same year, and is still recognized by USAG, told Christy about the upcoming games. Al and Christy knew that Greta, and many other people, found the judge to be nice and reliable. She stated, when they asked for advice, that Christy did not have the right body fit for the Olympic team, comparing to many other gymnasts, like the Russians and Romanians, who were thin and pubescent. Christy wasn't as physically thin as they were, because her body was built differently. Al Fong and Christy were devastated. At the time, weight was a huge contributor for those who would or wouldn't make the team. This judge wasn't wrong because there have been many athletes in the past that have been neglected because they hit puberty before the Olympic trials. To some, this would offend and break a child. But to Christy, this advice made her believe that this was the only way, because after all, Triber was a well-renowned coach and judge. Any advice that a higher up like her could provide was like Olympic holy water. So when Greta stated that she wasn't the correct body type, Christy immediately assured that the judge meant the only way to excel was to lose weight. So Henrich, naive and unaware of what this entailed, agreed with the judge. Surely, someone of high authority and international experience would know what would qualify for Olympic gold. How could an adult provide nothing but positive feedback and advice for an athlete? So, after that meet, she virtually stopped eating. Sandy Henrich, Christie's mother, recalls meeting her daughter at the airport upon her return. The minute she got off the plane, the first words out of her mouth was that she had to lose weight. A judge had told her that she was fat. Christy was absolutely devastated. She had a look of panic on her face. And I had a look of panic on my face. She weighed 90 pounds and was beautiful. When she returned to Gage, her gym in Missouri, known as the Great American Gymnastics Express, she set her eyes less on training for the big skills and more about what she was consuming. When a gymnast and coach relationship is so strong, they value any advice given. The gymnast looks at the coach as a second father figure, sometimes listening to the coach's advice more than her father alone. It's the numerous hours spent alone, the physical touch of congratulatory hugs, and the deep connection that is gymnastics bringing two dedicated people together. In the months leading up to the Olympics, Christy began to lose weight. She made it a goal to focus less on her performance in the gym and more on what she was eating around the dinner table. Since she spent small amounts of time around her family and more in the gym, it was very easy to cut calories. Sometimes, as recalled in Joe and Ryan's book, she would eat up to one apple a day. On average, an apple contributes to roughly 95 calories. On an average four hour practice, not including the intense elite level conditioning, a gymnast will burn 10 times what Christy would consume in a day. She was losing muscle because there was no longer any fat left in her body to burn for energy. At the 1988 Olympics, to qualify for the team, one must place between first to sixth all around. To qualify as a traveling alternate, you must play 7th, and for a non-traveling alternate, 8th. Christy placed ninth, just barely missing the Olympic team. Her mother stated that she was absolutely devastated as she saw a look of shock in her daughter's eyes in the arena. 
disgusted that she didn't lose enough weight to make the team. She set her eyes on the 1992 games. After all, the judge was right, but unfortunately, it wasn't enough weight to make this year's team. Next year, she would be more prepared. After all, her nickname was Extra Tough, and there was no mountain that she couldn't climb. Nancy Thies, now married and goes by Nancy Marshall, was a young star making the 1972 Olympic team at just the age of 15. Credited for being the first person to perform back aerial tumbling on the balance beam, she wowed the Olympic stage. At one meet, when her music would not play, she performed to a Chinese pianist with such grace as if she was dancing to the rhythm like nobody was watching. To her, it was merely a performance, not a competition. Her success ran so high that nobody knew she was battling a downward spiral in training. After the Olympics, I faced some of the challenges of disordered eating, Marshall said. I was in the category that does not eat healthy. I tried all the bad diets I could find, but fortunately, my parents recognized the problem and gave me the tools to combat it. Now, decades later, Nancy began to work for a nonprofit organization tailored to improving women's health and gymnastics. She traveled as a tireless proponent of athlete health and wellness in the USGF, a program created shortly after the demanding concerns the public showed about Olympian struggles to better their image. The athlete wellness program consisted of a referral network of doctors, trainers, and dietitians posted on the Federation's website. Despite the coaches' complaints, several top gymnasts said that the program helped reduce high injury rates. Kathy Kelly helped with the organization. Kathy Kelly, former president of the USGF, credited the program by saying that it offers tapes, posters, and meetings to encourage nutritional health and coach education. She didn't state, though, that these were optional classes that were not enforced by coaches or officials in the organization. No gymnast was required to take classes to improve their health. As Christie's training continued, her weight began to drop to dangerous levels. As she performed at the 1989 Worlds, commentators discussed that she looked tired during warm-ups on floor. As she completed her first pass, barely making it around a double back, she fell on her head during the second pass. Standing up while powering through the end of her performance, she fell on her head yet again on the third double back. Commentators later showed her being examined by professionals. Christy was so weak from the weight loss that her training was declining. It wasn't because she was tired, though. It was because of how weak she was that her body was breaking down. Confronted by a gymnastic official, Fong was told that he may be training Christy too hard based on her poor performance on floor. After confronting Christy, Fong stated in Ryan's book that he contacted officials to get help. Christy would resist help, though. It wouldn't be stated until years later, but Fong tried to get her help and admitted her to a residential treatment center, not once, but three times. Fong tried to help, but every time he did, Christy fought against it. She'd refuse help purposely. One year later, Fong would kick her out of the gym, saying that she could not return until she gained weight. It was the last thing that Fong could do to nurse her back to health, by preventing her from doing the one thing she loved the most. It was incentive to get her healthy again. Christy took it as a personal attack. He could care less about me. He's just worried about his reputation. That's how he is. One year later, her family would seek more severe help as her weight dropped down to 60 pounds. In a span of four years, Christy had lost a third of her weight. Christy's fiancé and her parents agreed that the blame for Christy's obsession with weight should not fall only on the coach. It's the whole system, says Sandy. No matter what you do, it's never enough. Never. The whole system has got to change. Parents, coaches, and the Federation. That following year, Christy would lose another 8 pounds, going from 60 to 52. She was barely half her original body weight. That year, she would nearly die. 
with Christie's struggle making the headlines, the governing body reacted by testing the bone density of 32 gymnasts. Safe to say that only seeing three gymnasts needed medical attention. Kathy Kelly blamed Christie's eating disorder, stating it's merely a woman's problem and not a sport problem. They also increased their resources in Nancy Marshall's health and wellness program, showing that the organization was always aimed to promote healthy eating and education on eating disorders. Nancy Marshall tried to counsel Henrich as her weight began to decline. Christy wanted to get better, but she just couldn't make it, Marshall said with a tremor of emotion. We want to raise the red flags, but Christy was too far gone. She no longer focused on how much weight to lose or how it affected people around her. In her head, there wasn't a limit on how much weight was needed to be lost. She told a local news station in Missouri, My life is a horrifying nightmare. It feels like there's a beast inside of me. Like a monster. It feels evil. That same year, at a benefit to help cover Christy Henrich's eating recovery medical bills, Nancy Marshall spoke again. She stated, Christie's struggle will not be in vain. She continued to press the Federation's executive committee to do something about eating disorders. She said, I sort of got this nod like, yeah, okay. Then nothing would happen when referring to creating change in the sport. In 1994, Christie would pass away from multiple organ failure. She was getting intensive support care, said Dr. David McKenzie, who treated Christy Henrich during the last week of her life. The final three days were spent in a coma, but a person passes to the point of no return. And then, no matter how aggressive the care is, it doesn't work. The major problem is a severe lack of fuel. The person becomes so malnourished that the liver doesn't work, the kidneys don't work, and neither do the muscles. The cells no longer function, he said. How could this happen? Losing a gymnast, the first and only to this day in America, to such an addictive disorder? Christie's doctor stated, A large percentage of coaches tell the girls how to count calories, how to act, what to wear, and what to say to the public. It becomes a control issue for the girl. They feel the only thing they can control is the food they put in their bodies. And that's what it is. Control. Gymnasts have no control in their lives, but to listen to those who they are influenced by. The toxic culture of the USGF, and now USAG. After Christie's passing, the organization was under fire for allowing this to happen. As a result, Kathy Kelly placed warning signs on the educational tapes previously distributed. In the video, it stated that if a gymnast believed the coach is asking them to do something they shouldn't do, or misleading them about the weight of training, that they have the right to contradict him or her. What we tell them is, if all the adults in your life are screwing you up, you have the ultimate control, Kelly said. Code of Ethics. There was no tribute to Christie in the following meet, which was held one month and two days after Christie's death. To this day, there is no discussion of Christy Henrich, and education is so little with USAG. Officials in the U.S. have become so fearful of another Henrich tragedy that they no longer list athletes' weight in the media or release such information to the public. But beyond this change, little was done within the organization. As much as the news of Henrich's death made me sad, it also made me angry, Rigby said. This sort of thing has been going on for so long in our sport, and there's so much denial. Many people continue to deny that Christie's death was contributed to the sports culture, including Bella Crowley. Wake up, people! Christy Henrich, bless her heart, was not even close to gymnastics at the time she was getting deeper and deeper in the whole tragedy. It was exclusively her and her family. Blame it in the right area. Sure, the coaches are making remarks about being overweight, but it is normal in every sport. It doesn't matter what sport. Kathy Kelly would lead the organization to brush it under the rug, saying that they have improved it as an organization by saying that they have newer technology and better questionnaires. Their dietitians are on site, and they have a healthier group of kids now. But those dietitians were never helpful, 
based on Jennifer Say's memory. Once at a camp, Jennifer discussed her diet history with a dietitian. This dietitian glared at Jennifer as she sat down in her office. Is your mother overweight? Your dad? What about your brother? If they aren't fat, what's wrong with you? The combined pressure of competition, constant dieting, a desire to win, and a fear of failure took their toll until it began receiving treatment and learned the value of good nutrition and relationships, said Kathy Rigby. When your potassium levels get as low as mine, and vitamins and minerals are missing from your body, it causes your heart to beat irregularly. Everyone struggled with the deadly disorder, and obviously, some of the dietitians back then didn't make this any easier. Yet those who oversaw the organization refused to listen to those who spoke up. Even Nadia Komenich, one of the star pupils even to this day, had lost nearly 40 pounds in under two months. At the age of 28, years after retirement, she told Life magazine that she still viewed herself as fat and ugly. The writer of the magazine witnessed her still show signs of an eating disorder that day when they went out to dinner, leaving to throw up in the middle of dinner heading to the restroom. In a 1996 seminar led by Nancy Marshall, the Chicago Tribune discussed that with the amount of people who conducted the seminar, consisting of Shannon Miller's mother, a licensed psychologist, and pediatrician, that only 100 people attended it. The president of the wellness organization was not surprised, though, because, again, the higher-ups sweep this under the rug. Nancy continued to work on the athlete wellness program. She increased staffing and hired nutritionist Dan Bernardot to work with the national team. Dan stopped the practice of weighing the gymnasts at national training camps and banned talk of gymnast height and weight. Marshall encouraged dietitians and doctors to screen more recently on signs of eating disorders and to report it right away to parents and coaches if they were at risk. Marshall and others felt that her program was working because the 1996 team was at an older age, weighed more than before, and most of the team were menstruating. Three of those members, Dawes, Miller, and Strug, proved that athletes were getting healthier when compared to the bodies from four years previously. As years passed and Christie's death went on, only a memory to those who were there to witness it eating disorders would continue to be relevant. Vanessa Adler, who became a gymnastic star when she was just 15 in 1997 and was one of the highest profile athletes in her discipline in the late 1990s, reflected on her career in an episode of the Gymnastic Podcast. Her gym, WOGA, or World Olympic Gymnastics Academy, would hit its peak as becoming one of the best facilities in the 2000s time period. We had this paper in the coach's office, referring to Valeri Lyukin, where they had a scale. You'd weigh in the morning, and you'd write it down. And then after workout, you'd write it down. You'd weigh at nighttime for the last workout, and you'd write your weight down, which is so stupid because it just doesn't mean anything. Adler said when she went inside a hotel room and tried to address the judges and other officials inside during the 2000 Olympic trials, I thought they were going to help me when I asked for help, and basically their answer was to stop eating. In the Out of Balance article, it states that U.S. gymnasts competing in the 2001 World Championships were provided so little food that family members smuggled snacks into the team hotel by stuffing them inside teddy bears. Kathy Kelly once criticized 1996 Olympian Dominique Mociano for eating a slice of bread at a team national training camp in 2006. Kathy Kelly, who at the time, in the 90s, was in power for only 10 years, had no background in gymnastics as a coach or gymnast, though still acted over a decade later that she was providing education through the wellness program and had their best interest. This wellness program was very contradictive to her true self. Vanessa Atler said in her gymcastic interview that the team overheard Kathy Kelly calling them the fattest team they've taken to Worlds. Jimmy Dancher also struggled with an eating disorder. She said, When I told someone at USA Gymnastics that I was starving myself and throwing up at meals, their only response was, I don't care how you do it, just get the weight off. 
I remember once having the flu and throwing up for five days straight. When it came time for my weigh-in afterwards, I had lost seven pounds. My coach said I needed to figure out how to keep it off. At another point, my coaches make me take epiphedrine for weight loss before the drug was banned by USAG. Sean Johnson, 2008 Olympic gymnast, would suffer from an eating disorder after given weight loss pills at the ranch through a medical doctor. Ashley Davis, former gymnast of Kurt Thomas, tried to report Kurt Thomas's behavior as early as 2009, reaching out to a local gymnastics judge who also taught the USAG safety course in Texas and shared everything, like how she consumed only lemon water with cayenne pepper while training twice a day, or how Thomas gave her prescription diet pills and laxatives as a teenager, or how she ran in trash bag suits in the middle of oppressive Texas summers for two hours in between training sessions. She says the coach blamed her injury on her weight. This is what an extra five pounds looks like, she says, and that he called her washed up. When Valerie Lucan offered former gymnast Andrea Orris some advice about her weight when she was 12, Orris wasted no time following it. She eventually developed an eating disorder that at one point would require hospitalization with heart damage and doctor-ordered bed rest, leading to body dysmorphia disorder that continues to impact her more than 20 years later. Oris was struggling with an uneven bar scale. Valeri said, You know why you're falling. You've gained three or five more pounds on your butt, Oris said. But then he said, but that's okay. There's always ways to work with that and change that. Liukin said, It's not a bad thing to go to bed hungry, though. She continued, recounting the advice that he gave her. Three nights before a competition, do not eat dinner, and you'll feel very light. And start weighing yourself. Oris was 4'8 to 4'10 at the time. Might not have even been 70 pounds, she recalls. This is still an ongoing epidemic. How do we stop Parkett's gymnasts from leaving the sport with dietitians because of how bad their eating disorders have become? How do we stop gymnasts from being slapped by Bella Caroli on the thigh for having too much fat on their butt? How do we stop Jordan Childs from being called fat because her butt is too big in her coach's standards? How do we stop Kim Zemeskel and her husband from comparing gymnasts to whales? How do we stop Chai Han from Everest by placing girls in fat groups and forcing them to do extra conditioning? It all comes down to proper education. 2012 Olympian Michaela Maroney once said in a gymnastic podcast that if she could change the environment, she would hire trained dietitians that focus on athletes' health better than the ones they have, along with not allowing gymnasts to eat next to coaches because gymnasts feel judged and they don't want to eat in front of them. And that's a start, but we need more. It all comes down to education. But what are the signs to look out for with education? Unfortunately, many coaches are not aware of the power that their comments have on their athletes. As a coach, you must refrain from body talk as a way of punishing or giving advice on how to train. A double back should not be blamed on gaining two pounds if the gymnast has done the skill before. It could be for other reasons. If a coach is concerned about a gymnast's weight, though, they must take this concern only to the parent. The coach should remind them that they're only responsible for a gymnast's eating habits when the parents are not around. And when the gymnast eats, they should never restrict calories because of the number of calories that a gymnast needs to perform. Always remember that restricting calories leads to increased injuries and poor energy levels. And parents aren't always aware of their daughter's eating habits because they seldom spend time eating with them. They must also pay attention to warning signs of an eating disorder when a gymnast becomes more involved in the sport. They must be observant about food. Do they eat before practice? It's common to not eat before practice because doing so may lead to an upset stomach. But gymnasts should not restrict food before practice. Sometimes they will do this to prevent additional weight gain before their unhealthy weigh-ins at practice. And let's make it very clear here. 
If a parent has a child attending one of these gyms, do not continue to train there. Another warning sign is when a child tracks how much they eat with either a fitness app or an eating log. When a gymnast makes it a goal to count calories, they focus less on eating because they associate it with bad things. They punish themselves more frequently because they know that if they don't, their coach will. Another warning sign that a child may face is becoming so obsessed with food that they constantly talk about it. Like Christy Henrich, she would cook meals for her family, but refuse to eat them. This trait, though all too common, shows that although the child is interested in food and enjoys finding recipes and pleasing others, that she is not going to eat it. They restrain themselves from eating large portions, only eating things that are light in calories or fat. They forbid foods that are processed, fried, or store-bought. But let's make one thing very clear. Not all foods are bad foods. Foods that encourage performance recovery, like milk, is great, but eating bad food is okay. It won't just make you gain five pounds overnight, though. People tend to think that carbs are fattening, but the truth is, this is the main energy source for the body. Without it, people like Jennifer say lack enough energy to prevent falling on the beam and getting hurt. Fats aren't bad either. Fats absorb important vitamins and minerals. They support cell function, and yes, as shocking as it may sound, they also help provide energy. If you cut fat, it's going to delay the recovery process. This is because without it, your immune system will weaken and delay recovery. Not to mention, it will also weaken the muscles. And if someone thinks that cutting out these macronutrients will lower their appetite, then they are wrong. The body will increase its appetite because it needs it. It will make it harder for your mind and body to work together and just spiral out of control. And it's sad to hear that gymnasts focus on just weight and assume it's all body fat. Your weight accounts organs, lean muscle, water weight, and many other factors. Gymnasts really shouldn't be worried about weight that they have rather than if they are at a healthy weight for their age. One sign to look out for is how often a gymnast weighs themselves. Weighing numerous times a day isn't healthy or accurate since sodium, hormones, and water weight can fluctuate two to five pounds depending on many factors. And again, remember, if a gymnast is being weighed at the gym, that should be an automatic red flag. A coach should not be fixated on weight, and if they are, this isn't the right gym for you. If a gymnast is showing signs, the first step should be seeking help. Dietitians, psychologists, and pediatricians are all educated on how to counsel children. And the decision to return, if the gymnast is forced to be taken out of the gym, should always be asked by the gymnast and nobody else. A parent or coach should not be the reason that a gymnast returns. It should be her motivation to return and nobody else. There are so many physical and psychological complications a gymnast goes through during an eating disorder. And if placed back in the gym, this could trigger those complications very quickly. 2016 Olympian Lori Hernandez shared in a U.S. Weekly article in 2021 that even though she needs to be conscious of her diets as an athlete, she doesn't count calories anymore. It just got a little bit obsessive and unhealthy. And now, I don't count or track calories, she said. I'm just kind of eating clean because... Also, I know that food is fuel, and for what I do, it's important to eat healthy. With my research, I found that the athlete wellness program was discontinued, amid Marta Caroli claiming that it was no longer important or helpful. They do have an athlete health and wellness council, which does have accredited members. The vice president, Annie Heffron, is a part of the council, but the president is not. Nancy Marshall is not a part of the organization and is now a director for human resources in Oregon for a local college. Bill Sand hopes that because of the shift in women's body types, like Simone Biles' muscular frame, that it never resorts back to the tiny fragile bodies like Nastia Liukin. He stated that strong explosive athletes are, indeed, healthier, better able to withstand the rigors, 